All right, welcome back, everybody, to another episode of New Agreements. I'm here with the one and only Steve Simpson. Thanks for joining us. Pleasure. Good to see you, Dave. And this is the second, I think, of a number of special edition New Agreements where we're thinking about the ocean. In November, October, November, I went and sailed for my sins to COP26 with a bunch of other amateurs. And we met Steve along the way. Um, who basically ended up creating a mission for us, taught us about listening, putting microphones, hydrophones under the water and the power of that in listening to the ocean and what that can uncover for us in both art and science. And I took that story to COP26 and a whole adventure unfolded from there. But what I want to do today is get into the kernel of one little idea, which is actually a huge idea, that... The very first moment I met you that morning where it was like dark and we're coming in on the rib and crash landing it on the concrete. (laughs) The guys were filming with their big cameras and there was this little 30 second clip that you said that just blew my mind. So if you take a cylinder and you get um, newly hatched larval corals and you put them into a column and you hang it over either healthy coral reef or over degraded coral reef. Over degraded, they keep swimming up, ah. and over the healthy corals, they stop and they sink down. Mm. But if we put the column horizontal and we have a speaker playing the healthy yeah. reef, they can actually move horizontally towards the sound, <laughs> which is mind blowing. Because I mean, it's mind blowing because they don't have a mind. You know, they yeah. don't have a brain. Yeah. They don't have a central nervous system, mm. and yet they can still coordinate their swimming mm. to move towards the sound. Did you lot come up with that? We were the first to find that corals could move towards sound. Yeah, but. I can't really claim it because I said that the group I was working with were crazy to try it. There's no way. You know, fish were responding to sound. I get that. They've got inner ears. Yeah, yeah. A bit like we do. Yeah. And so that makes sense. These tiny corals without a brain or central nervous system, I just thought, no chance. So that was end of October. You were telling me about this idea. You went off and carried on doing the filming for our documentary and it was amazing. But... I left there thinking, oh my goodness, I've just heard the most powerful idea I've heard in ages. Um, and then and then you went off in December to Curacao, right? Yeah, that's right. And you went to take this idea in the lab, which is that you can play music and in the lab, the coral larvae will move towards it. And you went and tested it in the real world. Will you tell us about that journey and what you found Yeah, absolutely. So um, I'm really lucky to collaborate with a research station called the Karmabi Institute in southern uh, Curaçao, which is an island right in the south of the Caribbean, uh, just off the coast of Venezuela. The reason that this is the best place in the world to be working is that they've really got an incredible calendar of when all the different coral species around the island are going to breed. Um, so corals are incredible at synchronizing when they um, and they have to do this because they're releasing their eggs and, and sperm into the water. They float to the surface and on one or two nights of the year, it's all got to be happening at the same time for those eggs to become fertilized. And then the eggs hatch and form little free swimming larvae, which then come down and settle onto the reef. So we went out to hit one of the coral spawn moments on the reef where we knew that we would be able to scoop up these baby coral larvae and be able to actually study them in the lab and also then out into the field as well. So it really was quite magical. I mean, we had several nights in the lab where we we had these, you can just about see them, they're the size of a pinhead, Mm. uh, kind of uh, creamy, peachy sort of colour. And so they're really just blobs moving around in a Petri dish Mm -hmm. on, on the tabletop. Um, I think we were actually keeping them in um, in salad boxes that we'd ground from the supermarket. But they're really quite happy just exploring in midwater, um, developing um, through uh, two or three days before they become ready to settle onto the, the seabed and start to make their home. And so we spent then several nights, which is really when they tend to settle out of the water. A measure of how unprepared we were, we lived entirely on butter sandwiches, <laughs> um, working through the night. Um, but we were we were basically in these vertical columns, so huge um, vertical uh, pipes. We had speakers down at the bottom. These are swimming pool speakers that play back recordings of sound. Normally they play back music that synchronized swimming teams can mm-hmm. use to keep beat with. Um, but they were playing back recordings that we'd taken at the nearby reefs the night before. Um, and we could switch those sounds on and off. We could switch between... Uh, healthy and degraded habitat sounds Mm. 
Um, and we could then under a microscope actually track the corals as they were moving around, these little baby larvae, they're called planulae. And when we switch the healthy recordings on, straight away these, these blobs just moving around in a kind of random walk suddenly went into this beautiful spiraling corkscrew dance that started taking them deeper. And it was as if literally the acoustic switch had been turned on in their, in their swimming patterns that presumably is changing how the way the, the hairs that beat to keep them swimming are moving. So they must go from being a fairly random hair beat sort of motion to being a much more synchronized swimming. Effectively, they, be they became our synchronized swimmers <laughs> and they spiraled downwards. But then if we flip the, the track to degraded coral uh, reef sound, then they just start moving randomly again. So you could wow. really see that this, this healthy coral reef sound was what they were seeking before they change their swimming to go down and find the place to make their home. And your little synchronized swimming team of these coral larvae, they are what becomes more coral, aren't they? When they sink yeah. down and, and make their home on the bed, that yeah. they crystallize, or I don't know what the word would be, and become that coral we're describing, don't they? Absolutely, yes. Yeah. So these are the, 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 the founders of each coral colony. The corals generally reproduce asexually. They're almost like photocopying themselves, uh -huh. creating their buddy, which is also, you know, genetically identical. And over the years, that becomes a very large colony. It can, you know, it can be the size of a car over a few hundred years. But each one of those tiny little coral uh, polyps is a genetic twin to all of the others in that colony. And it's just that first moment where corals have spawned and the larvae have then in, in the open ocean mm. found a new spot to go and make their home. Mm -hmm. That you've got corals on the move. Mm -hmm. Once they land onto the reef, if they get the right sounds obviously to bring them downwards and then they they use their set this sense of smell that the olfactory sense to find particularly um encrusting coralline algae which gives them an ID identity of the type of habitat that they can start to lay down a, a calcium carbonate skeleton they then fuse onto the seabed and they create a basal plate and then that individual first polyp grows and that's literally like a sea anemone. If you imagine a sea anemone um, about the size of uh, a pea at the most, often just the size of uh, a grain of rice. So it's got its little tentacles sticking upwards, catching food, bringing them into its mouth. But unlike a sea anemone that you find under a rock, it's got this rock solid armor plated skeleton mm. that it lays down. Mm. And once it's settled and it's fused and it's built its first skeleton, it then starts to bud and mm -hmm. it becomes two and then it becomes four and then it becomes eight. And slowly that coral colony starts to get bigger. So this idea that in areas where there are degraded or no coral reefs, you can play the sounds of healthy coral reefs and get coral larvae to found new corals that will then replicate themselves and become these strong structures over time. Is this news? And if it's news... Does it matter? Why does it matter? I mean, it is really new that we, we started by looking at fish, realising that we could call fish back to areas where they were no longer naturally attracted, so into degraded habitats. For corals and for fish, if they can't hear the community that they're seeking, that change their behaviour, that cause them to settle into that environment, they'll stay drifting over the top of it and will never make it their home. Mm. And without that influx of the next generation every year or every spawning cycle, that, that ecosystem will never really get going. Mm. Um, whereas if with sound, you can boost the attractiveness of that site, mm. effectively you start the party, mm. then all the animals will start coming and, and making it their home and they'll start to make noise themselves. So quite quickly, your need to add sound uh, goes away because you can start to actually, by calling in the animals, they effectively get the band back together again and, mm. and start making the sound themselves and calling in mm. the next generation again themselves. So otherwise the larvae will float off into the ocean and end up dropping down at some random place where they won't take root, won't get the nutrients and do the 
calcium carbonate mm. process that you're describing that turns them into the strong skeletal structures? They'll just die alone, basically, on the ocean bed somewhere? You know, probably statistically, you've got a 99.9% .9 chance of not surviving your larval stage, which is why for every, you know, gazillion offspring that are produced, two or three of them might get lucky and settle. But what we're doing really is trying to bring them into the spots that they're going to have the best possible chance of survival. Mm. So working with local communities, we've already tackled, you know, water management, overfishing issues, any pollution sources. So it really is like the ideal spot that you would want to go and make your home. The problem is it doesn't yet sound like it is. Mm. So if we can effectively trick the animals into Nirvana, Mm. then they can come and come and actually rebuild it themselves. I mean, that is pretty true for human communities as well, isn't it, really? You know, you can get rid of crime, you can put in the good NHS, you can make sure there's decent schools. But if there isn't that sort of aspirational culture, that, that often music and, and food and things like that actually bring you together... You don't get to realise that all the other good structure and infrastructure is already present as well. You might just drive on by that town and go to some other desolate place by accident. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's exactly right. You know, you, you see these new build towns that don't yet have a sense of community and they're not a great place to be living. And it's only once the first generation of, of the, the recruits to that environment, in that case, the first people to start moving in, form the community that really it starts to become an exciting place to be, which is yes. often why when we choose a, choose a place to live in a city, it might not have the best housing, but it's got, yeah. the best, it's got the best social setting, it's got the best nightlife. And really that's what all these animals are doing. It's, it's, you know, it took us a long time to really think of it from the perspective of these animals that, that what they're doing is getting on the internet before they ever go and make that <laughs> final decision. Once you fuse to the seabed, it's quite hard to move home. Mm. you only want to do it once if you're a fish and you're choosing to swim into a reef there's a 70 percent chance you're going to get eaten on the first day so you don't want to swim into 10 reefs before you get the right one <laughs> but by listening you can hear from a distance whether it's your kind of community makes the wild west look entirely domestic doesn't it <laughs> this is uh high stakes maneuvers it is um, I think the thing for me, Steve, when I met you and still feel it every time we speak is that in a land of degraded environments and also in the world of science, which can be very unimaginative and nothing is real until we've got the stats to prove it kind of landscape. I feel that you, you speak and, and act with a sense of real hope and imagination for the future. So Firstly, to thank you for doing that and being a voice like that in, in our modern world that's credible and does the hard work of eating the butter sandwiches in the middle of the night and doing all of that stuff. Because one thing to say hopeful things, but you've got to be pragmatic and, and practical and, and seek that evidence. But it does give you a different starting point, doesn't it, if you believe certain things about the way the world is and, and can imagine what, what they could be. So I guess my question to you now is, now that you've done it in the lab, and you've sort of done it in a more real world environment. You published this paper, which is called The Sound of Recovery, which you put mm -hmm. out in December. Where could this go? What could this mean for the restoration of our seabeds, of our coral landscapes? Where could we get to with this discovery? I guess the paper that, that we published just before Christmas was the final paper from a PhD student of mine, Tim Gordon who really did in an accelerated way go through the roller coaster of emotions that environmental scientists experience in that we thought that we were going to start by studying beautiful natural history and we were going to go to the Great Barrier Reef and it was going to be a wonderful experience and by the time we got there because of a bleaching event the whole place was dead and we swam around this desolate graveyard and, mm. and were deeply deeply gutted by what we saw realizing that really what we had was the front of the wave of climate change. We mm. were really seeing quite how vulnerable what we thought were very well protected coral reefs could be like in a time where you get a heat spike. And when we took recordings at those sites, they were, they were ghostly quiet. You know, the animals that make the sound were no longer there. The mm. sound had gone. And when we played those recordings back to little fish, we found that they were no longer interested. So the discovery that I'd made, what, 15 years before, of fish using sound to find their way home, 
was no longer valid science because wow. the sound had gone that they would use at the very sites that we made those discoveries. Wow. Which was gutting, really, really gutting. Mm. Um, but what we realized from that was that we had quite a lot of knowledge about this natural process and realized that it had changed. So we wanted to turn some of that knowledge into solution. And I think that's something that buoys me as a scientist, that the next generation of early career researchers are definitely not getting into this to measure and chart and map the end of the world, the death <laughs> of the environments that we mm. care about, the, the last gasp of the rainforest or mm. things like that. They're getting into science now because they want to fix it. And they really want to get on, on it. they're very active, very passionate. And it's a real privilege to me to be able to work with them because mm. I can give support and experience and training and resource to, to match that energy that we now see. Um, and so one of the things we did with this work was to take recordings that we had from the past when the reef had been healthy, play them back at sites that were now degraded, and we could call fish into those sites and super stock them so we could rebuild the fish community. So it made us realize that not only had we found rock bottom, but we'd also then found our way out of it. We'd built a ladder mm. that was gonna help us to start to recover that environment. And that for me is something that that does give me hope, not just simply because it means we're going to at least be able to try something. But then when we go to sites where we've been doing the coral reef restoration effort over a few years and take recordings at those sites, we hear that they've recovered. Mm. You find that the, you know, this key cue that calls all the animals in, that self-sustains the ecosystem generation after generation is now back again at a site that was otherwise just a degraded kind of a rubble field. So it, you know, for me, it's a demonstration. And there are so many amazing demonstrations of the natural healing power mm. of the natural world, given half a chance. Mm. If we find out how to remove the problem, then nature is phenomenal mm. at rebuilding. And for me, that's what gives me the greatest hope that we now are getting a better understanding of what the problems are to take them away. Mm. And we've got ideas of the technologies or the different management approaches that can alleviate the pressures mm. on the environment. Mm. But you are going a step further than that. If I relate what you've said to the rewilding narrative on land. Mm. Yes, it's about agency back to nature. Yes, it's about remove the harm and the, the man-made dominion over the land. But it's also about that starter fund, that seed bank, helping the land remember itself and restore the connections in the interconnected sort of process. Um, you know, what the rewilders do by putting some wildflowers in one corner of the estate, you know, or some native native mm. woodland in the corner is the same as what you're doing acoustically, I think, with, with saying, hang on, let us help you remember your own sound. And once you've remembered it, then we can leave you be. Yeah, that's really true. I mean, we're definitely looking to kickstart it. If you had to put loudspeakers out on reefs every year for the for ad infinitum, then we haven't got a great solution. Yeah. But if all you need is a few nights around a new moon when all the animals come back from the plankton ready to find a home, mm. put the speakers out then and you can super stock it, then it's an active intervention. I totally get that we're not literally just building fences around it and hoping that it recovers we're actively trying to accelerate that management mm. and recovery process in a way that's scalable. Mm. But I guess there's a couple of ingredients there. One is that you're trying to accelerate it by using only natural ingredients you know have come from that place, uh, like old acoustic recordings from mm. that place, mm. helping it remember itself. Um, and secondly, that you aim to take them away at some point. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. It, you often think of this with a tree with a little uh, support for a sapling. Yeah. You know, at some point the tree become stays weaker if you don't remove remove the support from the sapling. It doesn't learn to deal with the wind properly itself. I'm sure something similar is true with what you're describing with the acoustic support network. Yeah, that's right. It's it's definitely a, a kind of acute intervention mm. that doesn't need to take long before you create that self-sustaining system rather than it is a, a life support system that without it, 
then actually you're talking about a, a system that can't look after itself. Mm. It's almost like stitches, almost like acoustic stitches yeah. on a wound. Yeah. You don't, you don't, you you need them to bring the skin back together, but yeah. then you take them yeah. away. Yeah. So if we scale this up, as you mentioned, what can this mean? I mean, can we now take swimming pool speakers to get synchronized swimming teams all over the world? Are a lot of the corals degraded? Do we need more corals? Like basic questions for you, but yeah. I mean, to be honest, the most basic question for me and for all of us is, will the oceans be able to sustain corals in 50 years time? Mm -hmm. So all of this is short term solutions ahead of a longer term challenge, which is tackling climate change. Mm -hmm. I certainly uh, remain optimistic that we can tackle climate change. I think, you know, we are seeing technological, financial Um, behavioral changes Mm. which could start to move us towards a time where we have less carbon dioxide in the atmosphere where we Mm. start to reduce the the human element of climate change okay Mm. so that has to happen whatever else we do but given that we're going to do that what we then need to do in the shorter term over the next few decades is to make sure that enough biodiversity survives in quite hostile conditions in some places Mm. to then be able to recolonize larger areas as they Mm. become more habitable again. Mm. And that's really what we're doing with focusing conservation efforts in sites which have the greatest chance of of prospering Mm. through these decades where the waters are quite warm. So that might be in areas near to higher water flow that keep the waters cooler, where nutrients are not too great from, say, river outputs, so to avoid um, uh, overgrowth of seaweeds on the, on the corals, where they're not being overfished, so they're well protected, where you've got very strong local community engagement in the programme, such that the local communities have ownership over the reefs and protect the reefs as a result. Mm. And I think if we can protect enough of these beacons of biodiversity, oases of life, through the next you know, fairly challenging de- few decades, then we're in a situation where you could imagine by the end of the century, we've got more coral reefs than we've got now. Mm. You know, in 200 years, we've got coral reefs in some or all of the places that mm. they once were. Um, but it is a, it's a long game and we need to be playing this kind of short-term restoration on steroids element to it. Mm. to give us the biodiversity resources for recolonization on mass in the future. I think one of the things I've realized in my journey with the company Our Carbon is that, put simply, no one loves carbon. No one wakes up and goes, oh, oh, yes, just love me some carbon. (laughs) But everybody loves biodiversity in one way or another whether it's the colors the smells the tastes the sounds Mm. like we love it we do love it um and it's what makes life good so for me i think what is shifting needs to shift and i think what you represent in this part of what work you do is showing that as long as we can do the hygiene caretaking of balancing our carbon budgets there needs to be, and there are ways to restore our biodiversity. The thing that we love that depends on having the right kind of climate, which depends on the right carbon budget. But it's both, isn't it? We need to both be intervening on that and have something to fight for and believe that if we can balance that, we can still get the biodiversity. We may have lost some things, many things actually, but there's plenty still to fight for. There's plenty still to protect and redevelop and restore and grow. Yeah, and it's a, it's a vital piece of the puzzle. Otherwise, you think you might think even if we can do the carbon thing, why would we bother? Because there's oh, going to be oh, nothing left, or who yeah. cares? Yeah. So, what's next for you then, more practically, just to wind this little blast mm. on this idea up? People can see the links below to read the paper, mm. to go see the yeah. vlog of when we met. But yeah. what what's the next step in the journey of this narrative that you're unfolding? So we've got um, two students about to go back to Curacao. Um, in about a week's time and we'll be playing back recordings of healthy reefs and looking at the structures of restoration reefs to try to marry the attractiveness of the reef 
with then the security that the animals get when they first land on it. Um, because you don't want to be calling them to a, to a feeding frenzy. <laughs> um, so trying to think about what environments they really need for those first few days to be able to s- survive metamorphose, um, get through that early transition phase in their life before they become a reef creature. And then probably over the next year or so, it's starting to really work with different soundscapes and find out which elements of soundscapes the different species are most attracted by. So we can get more control over which animals we're drawing into different areas based on where they are on that succession journey Mm. of a bear environment through to a thriving coral reef Mm. so that we can build the ecosystem up one piece Mm. at a time in the right sort of order Mm. to give it the best chance of surviving. And before we come on to land with sort of ways people can get involved, because obviously we met through a sort of citizen science project, if you like, and Mm. have been talking with big tech company Mm. about a big artistic project. And I know you've worked with other brands. So we'll come on to that just to finish. But this podcast is called New Agreement. It's like what big ideas should we be coming around and agreeing on to make sure that life in the future is worth it and a good one you know is there some kind of new agreement that you think we should all be signing up to on behalf of our oceans for me uh, the agreement that i would love to find a way of having is the agreement with future generations um and and we actually work with um Uh, drama departments, art departments, music departments, language departments, to try to imagine what it is to have that conversation with great, great grandchildren. Mm. And to be able to form some kind of dialogue that allows you to think empathetically about future generations. Now, obviously, I'm trying to think a bit about future generations of corals and fish, Mm. Mm. um, and they really deserve a voice too. But it's really to be able to develop that agreement that we have that allows us to operate in a way that we feel that we're actually making decisions which are of benefit not just to our own generation our own lives Mm. but to reach into the future because i think the future is where we really need to keep that very strong vision Mm. of what a positive future looks like compared to what a worst case scenario future could be And if we can see that positive vision and we can have had that conversation, albeit through arts and culture, then I think that is where we start making behavioural changes Mm. rather than it all being each of us in a little bit of a race with each other to Mm. climb to the top of the pile or to get the best life that we can have in this moment in time. Yeah, fascinating. And it goes back to that sort of indigenous seven generation wisdom. How do you sort of create the arts fabric that lets you get back to that wisdom because it's not easy to get that level of perspective and maybe even more difficult in water than on land because you know I've been on estates where just through their own selfish kind of desires to hold on to their estates Mm. long-standing families think in five generations because the trees they're planting won't be pulled up for hundred years or so so they're thinking in, a, in numerous generations just because that's the nature of their business yeah. but it's a very small amount of us whose business is to think a hundred years ahead most of our businesses yeah. don't are between one and five years uh, yeah. funding cycles or renewals for our contracts or whatever it may be yeah. so you do need something beyond the market yeah. um to sort of get you into that kind of headspace yeah yeah so then practically to land then, Steve, sounds like it's still very much in PhD research territory. What kind of support is helpful at this point with this kind of story that you're building and growing? Growing is probably a more helpful metaphor in this case. <laughs> you know, brands, individuals, financiers, do you need any of them? Do you want all of them? How do they get involved? Ab- you know, absolutely. I think, you know, some of the challenges now are our scalability. And so that's always going to be beyond the scale of a science project to go and restore reefs over kilometres or tens of kilometres or many different islands. We need an ever greater army of people who are the not just the agents of change, the change makers, but also the those with the imagination Mm. to think of the solutions that we're not yet at yet. 
Um, and so that's investment in individuals through their training, through their experience, particularly bringing in a much greater diversity of people into that space. Mm -hmm. Sadly, in the UK, science and postgraduate science is still a fairly privileged world. Yeah. Um, and ways of both using the privilege, but also being able to diversify the voices, the minds, the experiences that we can really put into the melting pot mm. is only going to benefit the solutions that we can think of in the future mm. and the delivery of those solutions. And to that very point, there's somebody I want to introduce you to in Namibia called Ukarapo, who is this young Namibian marine biologist who is so exciting to speak to i think you'll get on really well great and if this podcast did nothing else other than connect you it probably would have been useful but um <laughs> okay cool and then on a practical level maybe you will send me a link where somebody could dive in to to find the the hub of the work your work beyond the paper yeah. if they wanted to yeah. connect in yeah. wanted to study with you things like yeah. that awesome steve always good love talking okay. with you always feel the energy um <laughs> Guys, thanks very much for listening to this high velocity conversation with me and Steve. I hope you will tune in next time for more new agreements about the ocean. And I'll see you soon. Take care of yourselves. Bye.